kind of title this uh, A Fair Warning. And uh, we are in some really weird times. Uh, if, if you, uh, you've been paying attention or maybe not even hearing the uh, Homosexual Act was um, signed into law, the Elliot Larson expansion this week, and a number of other things that are happening in Lansing. But I want to read to you a, um, a report that's here that gives you a little bit of an idea of where are we headed and what's, what's going on. And does anything in this sound actually familiar? In May 1919 at Dusseldorf, Germany, the Allied forces, now this is World War I. One. The Allied forces obtained a copy of some of the communist rules for revolution. As you read the list, stop after each item and think about the present day situation where you live and are all around our nation. And this is something that I picked up back in the 1980s. The Red Rules state the following. Corrupt the young, get them away from religion, get them interested in sex, make them superficial, destroy their ruggedness, get control of all means of public thereby get people's minds off the government by focusing their attention on athletics, sexy books and plays, and other trivialities. Now, does that sound like our day to day? Oh, yeah. Divide the people into hostile groups by constantly harping on matters of no importance, <laughs> like uh, Ken Kardashian, Facebook, and all the other baloney that goes on. Destroy people's faith in their leaders by holding them up to contempt, ridicule, and oblique. In other words, basically continue to do what? Tear down your political opponents, as we're seeing happening before our eyes. Always, true, uh, always preach true democracy, but seize power as fast and as ruthlessly as possible. By encouraging government extravagance, destroy its credit, Reduce fear of inflation with rising prices and general discontent. Foment unnecessary strikes in vital industries. Encourage civil dis uh, disorder and foster lenient and soft attitudes on the part of government towards such disorders. By argument, cause the breakdown of old moral virtues, honesty, sobriety, continence, faith in pledge word, ruggedness. Cause the registration of all firearms on some pretext with a, to, with a view to confiscate them and leave the population helpless. Take time to think about these things seriously. And we are, we are basically, uh, in our state, if not our government, vastly, if not already, gotten to the point where these things are more of a reality than they are a theory. Now I want to turn to Isaiah 5, and I want to just touch on uh, six woes that are here. And I want to focus this morning on not just the condition of things around us, but the condition of the loss. Okay? So we're starting off in verse uh, 8. Now actually the parable that, that precedes this describes, I would think, our nation in a nutshell, but I want to focus primarily on, on issues this morning. Woe to those who join house to house and add field to field until there's no more room and you are made to dwell alone in the midst of the land. In other words, the consumering of goods, land, prosperity, in other words, the whole focus is on obtaining things, all right? Number 11, what are those who rise up early in the morning that they may run after strong drink, who tarry late into the evening as wine inflames them? Hey, how about, uh, let's say, uh, spring break? Right. 18, what are those who draw iniquity with cords of falsehood, who will draw sin as with carpet rope? The whole disinformation situation that we find ourselves in. Uh, number 20. Woe to those who call good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. 
21. What are those who are wise in their own eyes and shrewd in their own sight? 22. Woe to those who are heroes at drinking wine and valiant men in mixing strong drink. So these are kind of some of the things that are, that are happening around us, are they not? Yeah. We're seeing the total redefinition of our culture behind our own eyes. And so what we're looking at is basically this morning the state of of the lost. I want you to turn with me, if you would please, to Ephesians, the second chapter. Ephesians 2. This is Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And he describes a situation that um, I'm going to break down to you and, and have you uh, basically see a contrast here. This chapter 2 is a contrast. And it starts off with things, and I want you to think about your past, as well as those around you who are not believers. Okay? And you were dead in your trespasses and sin, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sun's of disobedience okay and he says if you skip over a little bit passions of our flesh carrying the desires of the body and the mind where by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind then skip over to verse 11 therefore remember that one time you Gentiles in the flesh the uncircumcision that is called the circumcision which is made by the flesh of hands Remember that you were at times separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Now, now this describes in a way, and we'll look at another passage as well, but this describes where we were and where a lot of people right now are. Does this not describe our culture in decline the way it is right now, our society in decline the way it is right now. Now the contrast to that is what God has done to us. Let's look at the contrast. Verse 4, But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive to, with Christ, by grace you've been saved and raised up with him, seated with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that the coming ages might show the immeasurable riches of grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing, it is the gift of God, not of the results of works, so that one may boast. For we are his, what? Workmanship, Workmanship created for what? Grace. Good works, which God does what? Prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, why is this important? If we go back to the Isaiah 5 passage, what we see is God prepare, preparing a vineyard. Now, this, this passage, just keep your finger there in Ephesians, but flip back over to 5 for a minute, okay? He, he uses this parallel in relationship to Israel and what he did done for Israel and how they responded. Let me sing of my beloved, my song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a vine that in, uh, in it and looked for it to yield grapes but it yielded no grapes. Now, what is he basically saying here? He has done everything possible for the end result of what? What is he looking for that he did all of this? Wine. Wine. And what does wine come from? Grapes. Grapes, which is what? Fruit. 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 All right. So he has an investment here. Yes. And then he says, And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between many and my vineyard. What more has there to do for my vineyard that I have not done it? 
When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? Mm -hmm. And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its edge, and I shall be, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its walls, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will command the clouds not to rain on it, for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed, for righteousness, but behold, an outcry. And these things are the things that, that basically, if we want to make a parallel of it, we can say that this nation is Israel according to the pattern that is in there and according to the principles that is in this prophecy. Now, I'm not saying that this is a prophecy. I'm saying look at some patterns here. Look at the patterns of the, the initial thing that I talked about in the beginning, about the deterioration. Look at the situation that we just saw in Ephesians. Look at the woes and look at what is happening. But we are his workmanship, workmanship created for good works. Work. Now, that means something here. What it means is that we have been planted in a particular area of this world. Yeah. That we have been given a commission in that environment. In other words, there's a responsibility that comes along with salvation. It is not a situation of being a Christian at an altar and that's the end of the story and you just wait till either Jesus comes home or you die. Right. There is some reason why God invested in you. Yeah. There is some reason why he has taken you out of, pardon the expression, crap and has changed you into a participant and a son and a daughter in him. There's an old Lebanese saying with the Brooklyn Twins, and it goes like this. You never get nothing for nothing. And what we've done is we've preached a salvation that is a free salvation. And yes, it's free, but it also has a responsibility that goes along with it. Yep. Y'all there? Yep. Y'all there? Because this is the situation that we find ourselves in today. We are in this time period that God has planted us in for particular reasons that he has to the establishment of his kingdom. You see, there's something greater than just the Sunday morning service. There's something greater than just giving your tithe and your offering. There's something greater with a reason why you exist even to this morning. Amen. And there's something greater, and this reason for existence has to come into the fact of what are we here for? Run over to Romans for a minute, okay? And, and, and I want to, again, I want to kind of like bring some of this into a uh, situation here where you get a little bit of, a, a, of an idea of where things are and where they may go. And then we're going to hit on a couple of other things as well. Romans. But Romans in the first chapter, and verse 18. And, and again, see where these things are at that I'm mentioning in these passages, all right? For the wrath of God is revealed against, uh, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. There is a suppression of truth right now. Mm -hmm. There is a situation where we have called things that are evil and despicable and an abomination as pure and holy. Mm -hmm. On the same level of the institutes that God has arranged for the family. And that truth that stands against that which we are codifying in our myths is a suppression of the truth. 
I was watching a video this uh, this week, my wife and I, and in that video, uh, we were talking about, it was talking about people in the UK, that right now it's a law, if you stand in front of an abortion clinic within so many feet, and you just stand there and pray, you can be arrested. Indeed, a woman was arrested and tried on that very charge. In other words, we have gotten to the point where thought crime is on the horizon. A, what? A situation that we find like in Orwell's 1984, or Huxley's Brave New World. And where we are headed, that if it is a crime that you can't even pray on a location, let alone also it's a crime if you have dialogue with somebody in that zone, you will be arrested. Now, we haven't gotten to that point yet. But what we're seeing is not only just the suppression of truth, but the counterfeit truths that go along with it. And if we are not willing to stand, if we are not willing to seek out the truth, if we are not willing to speak the truth in an environment that is totally anti-Christian. Oh, oh you, you must be mistaken. There's never been a time period like that. How about when the church first started in Rome? For just being a Christian, you could be killed because you were looked at as a subversive. We are coming closer and closer to that time period. Look, look, look at what's going on here. God has revealed truth. How has he revealed it? For his invisible attributes, namely his, his eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in things that have been made so they are without excuse. God shows his glory in this creation. Verse 21, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God uh, or give thanks uh, for him, but they became futile in their thinking and in their foolishness or foolish hearts. They were darkened. And this is becoming more and more true. The, the, the actual thought of God in himself and his ways are now becoming contrary yeah. to what we are defining in our laws and also in our culture, okay? Claiming to be wise, they became fools. May I point to the Supreme Court Justice, who's a woman who can't even define what a woman is, okay? And exchanged the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creepy things. What about the rise of Satanism? What about in our very city, there's now an occult museum opening? Therefore, God gave them up in their lusts of their hearts to impurity, to dishonoring their bodies among themselves. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who's blessed forever. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relationships for those that are contrary to nature, and men likewise gave up their natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves a due penalty for their error. We, we've just okayed that in our state. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They were full of envy, murder, strife, deceitfulness. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. They know... God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die. And they not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. <laughs> Sounds pretty hopeless. And all God's people said, Amen, don't look in my thought life. What does he say? What, is the, the, what, 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 does, what does Jesus say in Matthew 5? in the Sermon of the Mount, when he talks about lust. 
He even says, even like what? Even if you look at a woman, or in some cases a man, lustfully you have done what? Committed, done you committed adultery. Now here's the situation. You know, we can, we can be there and we can say, you know, I know all these things and I've never done them. But the Tenth Commandment about coveting says that you have, even if you have not fulfilled the physical action. So it is not just the sinfulness of those out there. It's the sinfulness of of warfare that takes place right here. And, and we do spiritual warfare in the sense that it never touches the individual. Look at this. Then the Pharisees, verse 15 of uh, chapter 15 of Matthew. Then the Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. And he answered them and said, Why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your traditions? For God commanded, honor your father and mother, and whoever his father and mother must, uh, whoever reviles his uh, father and mother must surely die. But you say, if anyone tells his father and mother what you would, uh, what, what you would have gained from me is given to God, he needs not honor the father for the sake of your tradition. You've made void the word of God. Now, what is he talking about? That the 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 children were to take care of the parents. But there was, a, there was a way to get out of this called Terabah. And what it was is that you would say that you were going to give that money instead of your parents to the treasury of the tabernacle, or the temple, rather. The issue is this. This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching doctrines, the commandments of men. And he called to the people and said to them, Hear and understand, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a person. Then the disciples came to him and said, Do you know the Pharisees were offering when they heard you saying? Okay, they were offended when they heard this saying. He answered them and said, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. Let them alone. They are blind guides. And if blind leads the blind... Both will fall into a pit. But Peter said, explain the parable to us. And he said, are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth, into the stomach is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and, it, it, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murders, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defiles a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. In other words, what is in your heart? There is too much religion going on and not enough of relationship going on. And I'm painting maybe with a broad, br a broad brush, but it's basically what is the response of the majority of the church. And we need to be careful that we do not fall into the same pit. And I'm not saying that in a sense of like we are superior to others. I'm saying that in a sense of a warning. That it becomes so easy to start talking about other people. Yep. Other churches. Other situations. It becomes so easy to bring about divisions. One ministry has a, a problem with another ministry or a problem period within the ministry. And therefore what takes place is that you have an amoeba that splits. And there's no reconciliation. And everybody's in competition for various things. So they do various things in order to win the competition. How many people do you have? How big of the, is your building? Who are you having speak at your church? It's a great church with great preaching and great this and great that, but is the heart actually engaging the individual? Is the heart actually engaging the Spirit of God? You know, I watched certain things this week as well about how people downplayed or criticized or delegitimize what happened at Asbury and a lot of other places. The same thing with the Jesus Revolution meeting. 
A mo movie, rather. Well, this is not a revival, because the music is at the wrong tempo. Oh, this is not a revival, because look at everything that is going on. Oh, that movie shouldn't be shown, because look at all the flesh in there. God, help us. I would for God to see the same thing that happened in that movie happen in our midst. Amen. We have a problem, and that problem is the fact that the heart has become hardened to the point that we would prefer our comforts and God at an arm's length rather than true repentance, discipleship, equipping, and affecting a community. The comfort zones are being taken away. And for you pastors who say something like, well, I, I, I'm, I'm going to obey the government. Well, well, I don't want to lose my 501c3. Well, we don't have enough money to do the, the things that we need to do here in ministry. May, may I tell you something? All those excuses... Are excuses. That's exactly right, are excuses. To move forward requires the fact that your heart is burning like that of Paul. Let me read to you a little bit here. The Decay of Conscience by President Charles Garson Finney, the Independent New Yorker, the Independent New York, it's a newspaper, December 4th, 1873. Brethren, our preaching will bear its legitimate fruits. Let me say that again. Our preaching will bear its legitimate fruits. If immorality prevails in the land, the fault is ours in a degree. If there is a decay of conscience, the pulpit is responsible for it. If the public press lacks moral discrimination, the pulpit is responsible for it. If the church is degraded and worldly, or degenerated and worldly, the pulpit is responsible for it. If the world loses its interest in religion, the pulpit is responsible for it. If Satan rules in our halls of legislation, the pulpit is responsible for it. If our policies become so corrupt that the very foundations of our government are ready to fall away, the pulpit is responsible for it. Let us not ignore this fact, my dear brethren, but let us lay it to heart and be thoroughly awake in our responsibility and respect to the morals of this nation. And it's not just the pulpits, it's the church as a whole. It's the unwillingness to engage a culture that is deteriorating. You are the salt of the earth, and the salt is a pre preservant. But no, I want to go to this church because the preaching's better. Oh, oh, the music here is so great. Oh, oh, God is moving over here. We have to understand something, and what we have to understand is where is our commitment to our calling? And it's so easy to make up excuses. It's so easy to say, not yet. Well, this is not the right time. We do not have time anymore. Yeah. The days of sitting on the fence trying to please both sides is over because the fence is gone. We have to understand what is our ministry? What is our calling? What is our commitment to the ministry, to the calling that God is calling us to? Otherwise, let's just roll over and die with everybody else. It's very easy, again, to have spiritual warfare out there and fighting demons and all this stuff. What about the demons and stuff that's inside of you and the sin that's inside of you? What prohibits you from selling out to God? What prohibits you from working together? What prohibits you from waking up to see what is around us? Let's turn to first, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.11. And with this, I'll basically close. Therefore, actually, let's, let's swing back a little bit 
to verse 10 of this chapter, 2 Corinthians 5.10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Now, why is that there? Oh, I don't believe in judgment. I'm a Christian. I'm saved. I, I'm, 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 I'm guaranteed to get into heaven. But what has God done with you from that point? You see, the reason why judgment is there is twofold. One, for the wicked, but for the redeemed, it's there to show and demonstrate what Christ has done in and through you. Not that you're so great or anything, but God's glory is what he's done through you. Remember when you were in the pits? Remember when you were hopeless? Remember when there was no other way out? Remember when the revelation of God finally hit you that you had no way of removing sin and guilt and shame for all the stuff that you've done? And it constantly comes before you, like it says in Psalms 51, where my sin is ever before me. And, and the burden of that sin is on you. And, and it's not even a religious thing when, you, when you're when you seeking out peace. Therefore, since we've experienced that, since we've experienced peace, since we've experienced coming into Christ, since we've experienced everything in Ephesians 4, where it says one faith, one hope, one baptism, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. Do we persuade others? Oh. When was the last time you had a, 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 an encounter with somebody that you were trying to convey something to? But what we are is known to God, and I hope known also to your conscience. We're not condemn, uh, commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. For we're besides ourselves, are, are we? Are we concerned about what's beyond our particular setting here? It is for God that we are in, in our right mind. It is for you. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves. Right in Christian circles, that's, that's a very important verse there, that verse 15. Might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh. We regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, uh, God was reconciling the, word to, the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we're ambassadors to Christ. Now, now we love to use the verse 17, okay? But the verse 17 has to have the verse 15 beforehand. That he, we who died, okay? might no longer live for our, ourselves. Yeah. The, the question before the church today, us included in that brush, is are we going to serve him or not? Mm. Now, I'm not saying you won't be saved. I'm not saying that you're going to be a retrobate. What I am going to say is if you get into heaven, it's by the skin of your teeth. There is a greater calling than just getting saved. And we need to ask and understand, what is that calling? Choose you this day who you're going to serve. I 
you going to serve yourself or are you going to serve Christ? Are you going to serve the lost or are you going to be there with a condemning finger? As we read about Finney, what we do as a body of believers has an effect on the culture. A culture that is deteriorating, a culture that is derating the gospel, a culture that is out to destroy the church, a culture that calls good evil and evil good. Will we pick up the challenge? Or will we be like those during World War II who has the train on its way to Auschwitz with people crying out, would just sing a little louder, make the organ a little louder, and ignore the peril of their culture. Each one of us has a decision of how dedicated we are to not only this fellowship, but to the culture that needs your soul. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much for your word. We give you the honor, praise, and glory in Jesus' name. We pray, Father, that you would awaken us, awaken your church to the need that's all around it. And Father, enough of excuses, enough of we can't do this and we can't do that, or I'm just so inadequate, or God could never use me. Father, we look through your word, we find out that there's a lot of people that were there from Gideon, Abraham, David, who was an adulterer on down. Father, remove our excuses and give us the burden that, like Paul, we would say that we would need to persuade others. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.